Hi, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by David Burkus, who is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. How are you doing, David? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and David's best-selling author, uh, keynote speaker, associate professor of leadership and innovation. And what we wanted to talk about is his newest book, Friend of a Friend. And this offers uh, readers a new perspective on on networking, so understanding the hidden networks that can transform your life and career. Um, so, I mean, obviously networking has been, you know, it's been around for as long as uh, people have been around. Um, but and networking has always been seen in sales as, you know, a key component. But so what is it that people are missing about networking or maybe they don't know how to do it in a, in a more strategic uh, fashion? Yeah, well, I, I think the primary thing we're missing when we think about networking, especially in a sales context, is that it's, it's about more than just meeting strangers, right? You mm -hmm. talk to most people about networking, and they think that means going to the meetup, going to the cocktail hour, going to the networking right. group, going somewhere where they'll, they'll meet new people. And, and as it turns out, like one of the best things you can do is understand the network that's already around you and that is one or two degrees of separation out. Most people, it just by the, the pure numbers of it, most people already have everyone they need for their career, even their sales career, inside their existing network or one or two degrees of separation out. So jumping to that thing that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, that meeting total strangers thing, is often where people don't need to go. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the big thing. we got to reframe this. It's not about meeting strangers. It's about understanding the whole community, the whole network that's around you and acting accordingly. Yeah, and I guess in some ways, uh, you know, technology has enabled us to network in ways that we never could before. So maybe we've become, you know, less, I say, say, quality in our networking and more, you know, quantity and just using all of this. And as you say, maybe not looking at the gold that's right in front of our face. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, one of the analogies that I do often, we have this term, right, that you grow your network, expand your network, improve mm -hmm. your network. You can't, first of all, you can't do that. It's not your network. You exist inside of yeah. one network that is your industry, your community, et cetera. But the other thing is that carries a message, like you said, that the goal is just kind of running up the score, right? Mm -hmm. And if I just have more connections on LinkedIn or more contacts in my phone, I'll be more successful. In fact, some sales organizations even refer to that as like, oh, you know, it's just a numbers game. Well, mm -hmm. unless your product is a mass audience product, it's not a numbers game. It's actually a small world of interconnected people that would want to buy from you. They know each other just as well as they want to know you and how you can solve their problem. And so it's not a numbers game. It's a network game. So if somebody's listening or watching and they say, okay, I've got this network. How do I start in being more... Uh, surgical or strategic or effective in leveraging it? Yeah, so so two things. One actually comes from the world of traditional networking advice and, and job hunting in that context, but it turns out it's true in, in network science as well, and it's true for sales, and that is reaching back out to what we call your dormant ties. These are people you know, but you haven't talked to in a long time. Like strangers, like we were talking about earlier, it's not mm -hmm. about meeting strangers, these are people that have new information, new ideas, new introductions, and may even now be in a position to buy from you, right? But weren't when you met them. And so there's a lot of new uh, value that comes from those dormant ties. And the best thing is you already have rapport with them. You just haven't talked to them in a while. The, the goal, especially in a sales context, is to be constantly rewarming those connections. I mean, a good CRM system can help with that, obviously. Yeah. To constantly rewarming those connections so that when they have a need, you're not hitting them and being like sleazy or scammy or they're not feeling awkward reaching back out to you. It's just another series of conversations. Right. Uh, the second thing to do is what I call exploring the fringes of your network. I, I encourage a lot of people to ask the question, who do you know in blank of lots of different people? Now, blank could be a company, an industry, a sector you're wanting to get into. In a sales context, you might have to flip it and say, who do you know that's, that's experiencing blank? Mm -hmm. So it's the decision point, that life stage or career stage or, or pain point that triggers them into the buying process. But if you ask that question, as opposed to like, here's what I got, do you know anybody that needs it? You'll get a mm -hmm. whole lot more names of people that are one introduction away from you. And most of those names will be people that those friends, those colleagues of yours are actually comfortable introducing you to. Unfortunately, like we were talking about earlier in a technological age, we do this one backwards a lot of times. Right. We jump on LinkedIn and we see who's the head of whatever, and then we work our way backwards to find the person. And 
A, if we're begging for introductions from people, they may not actually want to introduce us, but B, they might not even actually be the decision maker in that context, mm. right? So a who do you know in blank or who do you know that's facing blank generates you a much bigger list of names and names of people who are in the actual moment you need them to be in to be ready to buy from you. Yeah, and it's interesting uh, actually to think how how rarely do I see that request coming across. I rarely do I see that, you, do you know somebody in this industry or do you know somebody... Uh, it, it seems to me that we've got all these networking tools, but we're not using them in that fashion. Most right. Of the time. Well, a lot of it is very egocentric, right? Mm -hmm. we, we start using these tools to expand our network, grow our network. We already talked about why that's a bad idea, but we mm -hmm. do it from what I have to offer. Instead of saying, look, here's the problem that I solve. Here's what a person who's facing that problem looks like which paints a different picture in people's heads, makes it easier for them to think through their, their existing contacts and, and find you two or three people that are facing that. Instead of like, like if you were in, in car sales, for example, who do you know that needs a car? Uh, I can't think of anything. <laughs> but if you ask, you know, who do you know that's having their first baby, which means they probably yeah, have yeah. to switch from a sports car or a sedan mm. to an SUV or a minivan, that you can usually, almost everybody can think of one or two people that are expecting or just had a baby or something like that. So it's a difference of how you're framing it in that person's mind and what you're asking for. It's not, here's what I have to offer. It's who do you know that's here that needs this? And, oh, I just happen to have a solution to that problem. No, oh, absolutely. And another thing you mentioned here is uh, becoming a, uh, you say, become a broker and fill structural holes. So mm. What does that mean? So structural holes in brokers, these are, these are fancy network science terms that uh, describe how a lot of networks operate. They're not egalitarian. There are nooks and crannies. There are clusters. Mm -hmm. Inside of organizations, we often call them silos, right? Yeah. But these are how in, in any industry, you'll notice there's groups that aren't talking to each other or there's industries that aren't talking to each other. And what we find is the people that make it a point to be an ambassador between those two communities mm -hmm. usually unlock a whole lot more value from their networking efforts than the people that are just trying to go deeper into one community, right? We know this from you know, the likelihood of coming up with uh, amazing disruptive ideas or even just helping information spread, right? So often we see, again, in, in that kind of, of sales context, there's, there's your industry, there's the industry that you serve, et cetera. But there's a lot of different tangential industries, mm -hmm. vendors, suppliers, other relationships that your clients have that often being that broker and pairing those two together and being seen as that source that's connecting the two can be a whole lot more valuable than just trying to get to know more people in one of those industries. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a great point. I mean, it's a real value driver, that idea of being a broker of capabilities about, you know, connecting people together and creating value when it's, and, and ostensibly, you're just bringing people together and it's nothing to do with you. But, but basically, uh, it will come back around to you because you would be seen as that person. So you're building a high level of trust. I mean, that's exactly right. Like it, it, it's seen in, in network science, the term is social capital, right? You build up mm -hmm. a certain amount of capital, like you build up a uh, wealth in an investment account. And a lot of us have a tendency to do a sort of tit for tat quid pro quo, right. keep track of I gave this to this person, therefore they owe me an A, like it doesn't work that way. Anyway, mm -hmm. people end up thinking you're a sleaze. <laughs> but three, more importantly, the network pays attention to who the givers are and who the connectors are. So even if you're not, even if I haven't, I've never done a favor for you, John, but mm -hmm. if you know me and in the industry and my reputation for always jumping on the phone to help out people like yourself, for always um, looking to connect the existing people, that, that social capital gets built up, that reputation as a giver gets built up. And so you're much more likely to even be able to spend some of that on someone you're just now meeting because your reputation precedes you because you're constantly connecting those people. That's a way more powerful approach. Take care of the whole community and trust that it'll come back to you on an individual level than take care of individuals and try and track it so that you can leverage it later. Yeah, and then people will make connections for you, right? Because they'll say, oh, well, you know, David's done a lot for me. I, I've got an opportunity to do something for him now. Yeah, there, I mean, there's actually a term in the research to describe that. We call that preferential attachment. The most connected mm. people are more likely to get new connections anyway, just, just by the nature of it, right? How do you meet most people? You meet them organically based on who you're interacting with. Sure. So the more connected you are, the more likely the people that you're connected to are going to connect you to someone else, right? So there's the giver and the reputational approach, but there's also sort of an additive or a compound interest approach to it. Um, I actually like this for the flip side of preferential attachment to those people. If you're one of those people that looks at those constant connectors, those networkers, and you're like, oh, 
it's just so easy for them, but it's hard for me. Mm -hmm. There's a reason it's easy for them. They put in the hard work that you're about to put in, and now they're getting dividends on all that hard work. They're getting compound interest. They're getting preferential attachment. So it does get easier over time. It's like a flywheel. You've got to get it going. But once it's going, yeah, it looks like networking is a whole lot easier for some people because they put in that work. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think networking is, it, it's, it is hard work because uh, it's, uh, it's something that needs to be, it, it's not, it's not something that you can just, it's a one and done. You just create your network and it suddenly starts working for you, right? You have to continue to nurture it over time. And as we said, part of that is you have to be doing stuff for other people in order for that network to operate. Exactly. And also, uh, this is where systems come into play, right? We mm -hmm. meet a lot of people in our day to day. If I were to ask you, you know, who's in your network versus going back and looking at everyone you've interacted with over the past couple of years, that second group is a whole lot bigger. But if you don't have systems in place mm -hmm. for keeping up with them, for regularly sending them articles or useful things or introductions or, or what have you, then a lot of that can fall by the wayside because it's too hard to keep it up here in your head, right? What's the old Dunbar's number? We can keep 150 relationships. Well, you need a whole lot more than that to be successful in any <laughs> business, let alone in a, in a sales role. So this is where, where systems come into play. You know, one of the big refrains I get a lot of times is people say, oh, well, I, I don't want to do that because it feels so inauthentic. But like in our personal lives, we use the same systems. I have a system that reminds me when my wife's birthday is so that I never forget to get her a present because I love her, right? Not because yeah. I'm transactional and sleazy and inauthentic, mm -hmm. because I'm so authentic that I make sure I don't forget. <laughs> In the professional context, it works the same way. If the relationship is important, then you may need to take steps to get it outside of your brain and into some kind of system that will remind you. No, I do, absolutely. And particularly as we live in this strange culture today where everybody is so distracted and machines and devices and everything are screaming at you all the time, that it's very easy to lose track of things about what's important unless you uh, have some system to remind you. Yeah, absolutely. Like you can make those notifications work for you instead of <laughs> against you, right? I mean, the exactly. first step is like printing them all down because we're so overloaded with it. But the second is, look, they worked for a long time. So why not put them to work for you? Yeah. So what's it, what's this uh, creating the illusion of majority? Mm. So this is a really interesting term for why things can appear to be more popular than they really are, right? So we see this both in the context of um, of popular music, popular art, plays, etc., and then also for people. And what it shows is that if you are popular or recommended from the most connected people in an industry because of how many people they're connected to, if just three or four of those people are talking about you, most of that industry can look like, man, everybody is talking about yeah. so-and-so, right? Uh, Tim Ferriss, the writer and entrepreneur, actually calls this the surround sound effect, but the term in, in network science is that illusion of majority. And it, and it goes again to show that networking isn't about running up the score or the number of connections you have, it's about studying the network that is your industry, that is your sector, that is your target market, so that you understand who those connectors are and spend more time building relationships with them mm -hmm. than trying to run up the score. And you end up looking more popular than you would be if you tried to just run up the score, right? And you only get that if you take yourself out of the network and remind yourself, it's not about building my network. I don't have a network. It's about the network right. that I'm in and what's the best way to navigate. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that point because, as you said, I mean, it's more important that maybe one person of, of big influence, you know, mentioned you or liked something of you than lots of people who maybe don't have that much influence uh, because, let's face it, we're, we are going to take note of the person of influence. Right, absolutely. And a lot of times these aren't the whale clients either. Sure. These aren't the people with the most amount of immediate gain. They're the people with the longest reputation. You know, in, in a lot of industries, like, um, I spend a lot of time inside the sort of the solopreneur industry. And a lot of times mm. the most influential people there are the ones that aren't trying to build a business anymore. So they wouldn't be a good client if I'm trying to market right. that industry. They're the most connected because they were hugely successful in the past. And now there's nothing for me to gain in the short term, but there's a whole lot to gain in the long term from building a relationship with those specific people. Yeah. And let's face it, those are the kind of people who generally have more time and want to give back and all of that. So they're probably the best people anyway, because they've not only have they seen it, done it, but they've got the time and they've got the inclination to help others. Yeah. You, I mean, you said it. And that's why they're the most connected in the industry. And that's why they're the better people to build a relationship with, even if they never become a client. If they let, know, like and trust you, then they recommend you. And that's way more valuable than just selling them something in the short term. 
Absolutely. Well, listen, this has been a fantastic uh, interview, uh, David. The book is Friend of a Friend, Understanding the Hidden Networks That Can Transform Your Life and Career and Your Career. Uh, before we go, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself, what you do, and how they can uh, find out more about you? Yeah. So in reverse order, the best way to find out more about me is davidburkus.com, B-U-R-K-U-S. All of my work, whether it's about networking or about management or even I do a lot of creativity and innovation, all of it is designed to help people do their best work ever by aligning it with what the research on human behavior actually says makes for peak performance, right? So right now we've been talking about that in the context of networking and that's my current job is just helping. How do we help people become better networkers by teaching them the science of how networks work? Fantastic. So my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Thanks again, David. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, see you all for another interview very soon. Thank you.